afternoon student saying welcome to today's lecture on the origin of sport in the ancient world. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going back. I mean, we are going way back to when it all began. That's right. In today's lecture, we're going on an intellectual adventure in search of the world's first sport. And it turns out that's an incredibly difficult task. I mean, it's not like someone 10,000 years ago was sitting around and writing a little note for us, right? Saying that they invented farming. Oh, and they also invented basketball. <laughs> so we'll have to get pretty clever today with our approach to look at athletics in deep antiquity. Now, along the way in this lecture, we're going to ask some of the hard hitting questions, right? Things as fundamental as like, what actually is sport anyway, right? What's the definition of it? And we'll investigate some of the world's earliest civilizations as well, right? So the Sumerians and the Akkadians, the Babylonians and the ancient Mesopotamians, and of course, can't leave out the ancient Egyptians of the Nile River Valley. Now, along the way, we'll be debating with ourselves, right, whether the evidence of these cultures uh, actually go far enough in order to establish them as the founders of sport as we know it. And we'll be putting evidence both into the category for, yes, this is sport, and, well, maybe it doesn't quite measure up in terms of what we consider sport today. So don't worry too much if your greatest athletic accomplishment is eating a pizza all in one city. Make a clever argument, and we might just consider it a sport. There's really only one way to find out. That's by journeying with me as we investigate the origin of sport. So, as you probably gathered from the introduction to this lecture, right, this whole lecture is all about discovering the origin of sport. So that's question number one, right? When and where do we get our first sport? Now, we're not just talking about the first sports in America, or the first sports in Europe, or even the first sports in history. We're talking about the very first sport ever in the world, long before writing was invented and the kind of quote-unquote historical period began. So this question, right, when and where did sports begin, is kind of inextricably bound to another question, one that must be answered before we ever begin to address that first question. And that, of course, is, what actually is sport anyway? Now, to some extent, this is an easy question, right? When I'm watching the Arizona Wildcats dominate ASU in basketball, I know I'm watching sports, and I'm loving it. But what happens when we actually be begin to kind of define the word, right? So how, for example, does sport compare to something like athletics? Or how does it compare to a game? Or how does it compare to the concept of play? What are the commonalities between those terms and where do they differentiate from each other? And once you start thinking of sports in comparison to these other phenomena, all of a sudden, the precise definition gets quite a bit murkier. So start thinking about that, right? How would you define the concept of sport and why do you go with that definition? Now, finally, and perhaps most importantly here, we're gonna start thinking about why sport emerges in this lecture. I mean, when you think about it, sports are really weird. They don't really help us obtain more food. They don't produce greater amounts of wealth or resources, for most of us at least, right? And they don't really do a lot that we generally consider functional in today's world. So why do people, especially people in very early societies, kind of seemingly waste their time on something that seems, from the surface at least, such a trivial event? 
Alright, so I've got some bad news for you here. I'm not actually going to give you the answers to all those questions, at least not the one about the definition of sport. You see, the thing with definitions is that they can differ from person to person. So your definition of sport might be different than mine, and that's totally fine, right? It's something I genuinely want you to think about. So what is a sport to you, and how does it differ from all those other concepts like athletics and games and play, that sort of thing? So go ahead, and I'd like you to take the next few minutes, maybe pause the lecture or do this afterwards, and make a little chart for yourself. And I'd like you to put these four terms on kind of the vertical axis, right? So sport at the top, then athletics, then games, then play. And then on the horizontal axis, put whatever attributes you think might be relevant, right? So it could be something like, physical exertion, or skill, or competition, right? Different aspects that may or may not be present in these different terms. And then you can jot down some notes in the kind of boxes for each of these in terms of how these phenomena, right? Sport, games, play, athletics, how they match up with those different attributes of things like physical exertion, skill, competition, that sort of thing. So you don't need to turn in anything here, but really think about this, right? I want you to think about it for yourself uh, and how it might help you inform your own perspective on what a good definition is for sport. So, next up, right, why did people start playing sports in the first place? I mean, think about it. It is really, really weird, and it does kind of seem like a waste of time and energy. Like, shouldn't uh, the people be out there, and instead of, like, running races against each other, shouldn't they be, like, looking for a mate, or defending themselves from saber-toothed tigers, or whatever else cavemen are doing in antiquity? Now, anthropologists who study the ancient past think that sport likely had its origins way back in the Paleolithic, right? The fancy Greek name for the Old Stone Age. And that stretches back to way before there were actually even real humans, right? Before Homo sapiens. And it goes all the way until about 10,000 BCE. Now, there's no writing at all during any of this time during the Paleolithic, right? So it's really difficult to tell exactly what's going on and why people are doing what they're doing. Nevertheless, there are some clues. So some anthropologists have argued that in its earliest form, sport was a ritual sacrifice of energy, right? So basically one of the main ways that people relate to the gods is by sacrificing something valuable to them, right? So that they get something good, maybe even better, in return, and so that they can also thank the gods uh, for something that they've already received that's good. Now in this case, sport can be seen as a kind of ritual sacrifice of energy. By the later Paleolithic, right, sometime around 30,000 years ago, we've actually got archaeological evidence in the form of cave paintings at places like Lascaux and Chauvet and Altamira, right, these caves in Europe. And these paintings suggest that hunting had evolved from something that was simply functional to something that actually also had a ritual component to it. So why else would you spend all this time painting these amazing things, right? Painting pictures of your food instead of eating your food. Well, while all of this is still highly speculative, speculative right? In many senses, uh, it's also untestable, but it does provide kind of an interesting set of possibilities, at least, for the very origins of sport, somehow maybe related to hunting uh, or ritual performance of hunting that then gets painted uh, on these cave walls. Now, let's go ahead and move forward in time here to where we get a little bit more kind of clarity in terms of the world's first sports. So, jump in your time machine. We are headed for the Bronze Age. All right, so here we are in the Bronze Age, a period we often associate with the rise of civilization. Now, because cultures throughout Asia and Africa and Europe become far more complex and far more stratified and far more sophisticated than they had ever been before uh, during this period that we call the Bronze Age. Now, in terms of chronology, this lasts from about 3000 BCE, about 5000 years ago, to about 1200 BCE, right? Just a little more than 3000 years ago. And one of the earliest places to begin um, is the region known as Mesopotamia, right? This is also called the Fertile Crescent because it's such an agriculturally rich area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So we're in this kind of area between the Tigris and Euphrates. It is located in the modern country of Iraq, 
And that's where we get our word Mesopotamia, right? Because it's very literally the region between the, ritter, the rivers, right? So Meso meaning middle and Potamia meaning rivers. So Mesopotamia, the region between the two rivers. Now the Fertile Crescent likewise, right, refers to this area uh, between the rivers kind of moving north uh, and west from the Red Sea and then kind of dipping back south and west towards the Levant and the Mediterranean. A really, really rich area in antiquity. Now, as the name suggests, right, these rivers made the region incredibly fertile when it comes to agriculture. And thus it was a hotbed for these early Bronze Age civilizations. So the Sumerians arose around 3000 BCE, right, about 5000 years ago. And pretty soon, they were building cities with more than like 50,000 people. That's way, way bigger than anything that had come before it. And we also get giant political and religious physical structures, things like ziggurats in this culture. And we also get stronger, more detailed evidence for the world's earliest sport, or at least somewhat sport-like activities. And what we see is that there appears to be a very closely related relationship between religious ritual and displays of power and skill associated with kingship. Now in ancient Mesopotamia, we have several types of evidence that point to the presence of combat sports. So we get sculptural reliefs, that is sculptures that are kind of still attached to the background. That's what we mean by relief, uh, instead of kind of fully carved into the round. Anyway, these provide evidence for boxing, just like you see here, where it looks like combatants are fighting, but not really trying to kill each other. Now, one of these, right, it dates to around 2000 BCE, and it shows the epic, uh, the epic hero, Gilgamesh, fighting his enemy, the wild man Enkidu. And in this case, we actually know the ending of this contest, right? So Gilgamesh wins, and they actually turn out to become best friends afterwards. Side note here, the Sumerian epic Gilgamesh is the world's oldest surviving epic, and it dates back a thousand years earlier than either Homer's Iliad or his Odyssey. Okay, now similarly, we get a record of this guy, Shulgi, the Sumerian king of Ur. And what he's done is he's run over 100 miles from the site of Nippur to the site of Ur. And he does this in order to demonstrate his power and his right to be king. Now an inscription dating to around 2000 BCE explains his motivation for doing this. So let's go ahead and quote this kind of in full. Here's what Shulgi says. So that my name should be established for distant days and never fall into oblivion. That it leave not the mouth of men. That my praise be spread throughout the land that I be eulogized in all the lands. I, the runner, rose in my strength, all set for the course. From Nippur to Ur, I resolved to traverse it as if it were but a distance of one double hour. Like a lion that wearies not of its virility, I arose, put a girdle about my loins, swung my arms like a dove feverishly fleeing a snake, spread wide the knees like the Anzu bird, with eyes lifted towards the mountain. And so basically, right, we get Shulgi in this inscription justifying his right to lead his people politically by demonstrating his athletic prowess, right? Now, this certainly is athletic, right? There's no doubt that running that distance, it was a huge distance. It is athletic. But is it a sport, right? Would you consider it a sport? So the king, after all, right, he's not racing anyone else here. But whether it falls into that category of sport, again, that goes back to your own definition. So you get to decide that. Now, right alongside combat sports like boxing, we get multiple depictions of hunting scenes. And as you might imagine, these kind of function in a similar way. So wild animals represent the powerful forces of nature. So the fierceness of a lion and the strength of a bull, right? And the king's ability to subdue such fearsome uh, creatures would undoubtedly be a sign of his power over nature and his ability to rule his people. Now, as it turns out, lions and bulls and bears, they don't always actually like show up exactly where you want them to, when you want them to, right? At the exact time of the hunt. And if, for example, the king failed in the hunt, either couldn't find the animal or couldn't kill the animal, well, you can imagine that that might be the opposite sign, right? Like the sign of the king's weakness or failure. Something he certainly wouldn't want to portray to his people. So as a result, the kings of Mesopotamia, right, they actually had these large gaming preserves built, uh, and they were stocked with fearsome wild animals. So then they would go out on foot or in a chariot with their army in tow. So it's not just them, their army's along with there to ensure their king's safety, 
right? Uh, and then they would kill the animals once they were found. So for all intents and purposes, this was more of like shooting fish in a barrel than it was a wild animal hunt. But once again, keep in mind, right? Keep thinking, is this a sport? Is it a spectacle? Is it a performance of power? How would you consider this sort of activity or phenomenon according to the definition you came up with earlier? All right, so let's take a little journey here down the Nile River. So at the very same time that the Sumerians were getting started in Mesopotamia, right, right around 3000 BCE, Egypt over here is beginning to flourish as well. So Upper and Lower Egypt, they've just united. And within a few hundred years of that, we've got the mighty Pyramids of Giza, right? Perhaps the greatest ancient monuments ever constructed. And the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that still stands today. So we also get Egyptian pharaohs developing new ways to justify their power, just like what we saw with Shulgi. So some of their strategies are similar to what we see in the Near East with the Sumerians, right? Especially the idea uh, of ritualized hunting. So we can see a good example of this over here on this hunting fresco from the wall of a New Kingdom tomb. So here the figure hunts to demonstrate his ability to uphold something called ma'at, an ancient Egyptian term that we might translate as something like order or stability. And in a separate pharaonic inscription of the New Kingdom, the king boasts of his ability to hunt down wild lions and bulls. So then he, of course, goes on to talk about how he had his whole army with him and how they were enclosed within a fence, but I guess that didn't really take the shine off of it for him. So we certainly see a ritualized ceremonial hunt here. Not really a wild hunt, right? but something important to demonstrate order and power. We also get some totally new athletic developments. So in particular, a ritual of kingship known as the Hebsed Festival. Now, ancient Egyptian kings ruled for life, and sometimes that life went on really, really long. So you can kind of imagine how this might be problematic, right? If a king gets really old and weak and frail, he might not be very good at ruling an entire civilization. Now, early on in Egyptian history, the Hebsed Festival was created to ensure the continued strength and vitality of the king. So after 30 years of rule, the king had to demonstrate his continued physical prowess by racing around the palace twice. And this was a very ritualized event. Now, if he made it, right, if he made it around the palace twice, his power was ensured for another three or four years, and then he'd have to do this again. Now, if he didn't make it, the consequences were, well, they were bad. You would be ritually killed by your attendants on the spot. So, that brings us to our main man, our big baller of antiquity for today, right? Pepi II, the longest reigning pharaoh in all of Egyptian history. So, he came to the throne at the end of the new kingdom, or sorry, the end of the old kingdom, right around 2300 BCE, and he was only six years old at the time. And he ruled, get this, he ruled for a whopping 94 years, until he eventually died at age 100. That means that sometime around age 36, right, he ran his first Hebsed race, and then he would have done it another 15 or 20 times after that, right, every three or four years until he died at age 100. Now, you may or may not consider the Hebset a sport, right? Again, it is athletic, but he's not racing anybody else. He's kind of racing against his own mortality. Anyway, uh, there certainly is a prize for completing the race, right? You get to keep your life, but it's not like, again, you're competing against other people. So perhaps you might consider it more of a performance than a sport or a ritual rather than a sport. But again, it depends on your own definition. Either way, Pepi II's reign is absolutely incredible. It was so long, in fact, that he outlived almost all of his successors. And upon his death, because there were no successors, Egypt rapidly fragmented. In the Old Kingdom, it was brought to a close, and Egypt descended into the First Intermediate Period. So sometimes, right, that long-lived reign, even though you think it would be really good, can actually have some negative effects, just like we see here. <music> Now, because of Egypt's arid climate, the level of preservation of archaeological remains, it is, it is just simply incredible. And one of the cool results of this is that we have well-preserved tombs, not just from the pharaohs, right, 
but from a pretty wide range of Egypt's population, especially the nobles and the kind of other elites uh, from Egyptian society. So today we're going to move into Middle Egypt and the site of Beni Hassan over here, okay? And this site flourished around 2000 BCE, right at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. Now, Beni Hassan is known for a vast array of aristocratic tombs, most of which have very, very well-preserved wall paintings and reliefs. So, moreover, these depictions, they're not just of the gods, right? They actually show scenes of everyday life in Egypt. So right here, we're looking at the tomb of the noble Bakhet III, which dates to the 11th dynasty, again, right around 2000 BCE. Now, among his depictions of daily life, we can see that several of these link us potentially to the world of early sport. So we can see him engaged in hunting activities over here, right? And over here, we can see a what appears to be a form of wrestling, a, or some sort of at least ritual combat. And you can kind of tell this since no one's wearing armor, there aren't any weapons, um, so we get the sense that this is more a sort of competition, a friendly competition, than it is an attempt to really injure or kill somebody. And then over here, we can actually see them playing Senate, an ancient Egyptian board game. So, the focus of wrestling here is particularly interesting, since it would seem to embody many of the traits that we traditionally associate with the concept of sport, right? Competition against other people, physical ex exertion, a kind of winner and a loser, a particular talent or skill, all those sorts of things. And Bakhet III's tomb suggests that this form of proto-sport, well, it wasn't just in the realm of the pharaoh, but something that perhaps nobles or even maybe even regular non-elites uh, of ancient Egypt, perhaps they could have participated as well. So Bakhet III's son, Kedi, also has his tomb preserved at Beni Hassan. And over here, we can see some of the best preserved hunting scenes from the early Middle Kingdom. So perhaps we don't have to conclusively uh, call it sport, right, in an official sense, but it does seem that we're kind of like approaching that direction. Okay, so as I put this lecture together, I just couldn't help but think that even modern politicians still engage in ritual performance of power and strength, right? Uh, and perhaps nowhere is this more prevalent than with good old Vladimir Putin, Russia's president who has never shied away from projecting a kind of wildly bombastic image of physical strength and prowess. Now, this isn't to support or critique any of his actions, right? Any of the Russian leader's actions over the past decade, but rather it's to show how cultivating an image of power is important to Putin in a way that's similar to an Egyptian or Mesopotamian king from millennia ago. So over here, right, we can see one of the classic images, Putin riding a horse shirtless through the Tuva region of Siberia. And over here, we can see once again, he is projected, projecting an image of strength, demonstrating the kind of proper use of an assault rifle. Here, Putin, once again shirtless, demonstrates his power over the creatures of the sea. And in an exhibition hockey game that he played in the uh, last year or so, Putin scored no less than eight goals in this exhibition hockey game. That's more than the all-time record in the NHL uh, for a single player in a single game in over a hundred years of professional hockey. And just in case you have to know, the original record, it was set back in 1920 by a guy by the name of Joe Malone, who scored seven goals for the Quebec Bulldogs. Now, if you mess with Putin, well, you might just get taken down just like you can see here as he demonstrates his skills in the martial arts. Need a dentist? No problem. Putin's got you covered. I'm not sure I'd be looking that happy, but hey, that's just me. And sometimes strength is just strutting around shirtless by a rocky mountain string stream as a photograph takes glamour a photographer takes glamour shots on you. Oh, and if it's an archaeologist you need, right? You could call me, but you could also call it Vladimir Putin, right? single-handedly retrieving artifacts from the bottom of the sea. I hope he's taken good notes on that. Documentation in archaeology is the name of the game. Very, very important. Anyway, the point of all this, of course, um, is that, you know, first of all, it's awesome and hilarious to look at images of Vladimir Putin trying to project this manly man image. But it's also, right, the point is also to show that the visual projection of strength and power isn't something that's gone away in the modern world. 
So some leaders certainly do it more than others, but conveying one's physical strength is often a metaphor for one's strength as a leader over a population, even if those two things have often like almost kind of nothing really to do with each other. So keep in mind uh, that as you look at political propaganda, right, uh, you may be looking at something that's intentionally projected by the leader or the king or the president rather than kind of an innate um, skill at leadership, whether it's in this country, Russia, ancient Egypt, or Mesopotamia. All right, you have made it to the end of another episode, at least the end of the very beginning of sports in the ancient world. Now, along the way today, we've learned a few things. So first, the identification of the world's first quite quote unquote sport is intimately tied to how we define the term, right? And that in large part is up to you. Now, during the Bronze Age in Egypt and the Near East, we get quite a few at least pseudo sports. So phenomena and events that kind of ride the line between sport and athletics and between performance and spectacle, right? Depending on kind of where one creates these boundaries. So we get, for example, multiple instances of combat sports, things like wrestling and boxing. We also get hunting scenes, right, both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. And we also get more formalized ritual displays of physical power and strength and athleticism, just like we see with Shulgi running his race or Pepi II running the Hebset in Egypt. And we've seen that the display of physical strength hasn't gone away, right? Even rulers in the modern world intentionally portray themselves as physically strong, even though this doesn't really have any impact on their ability to govern a population in an effective manner. So if you're getting ready to rule, make sure you look the part, even if it's just propaganda at its core. Just a couple lessons you can learn from the origin of sport.